Thank you, Justin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Justin said, we were asked this morning to pull something together, and it's always interesting to know how many ways you can look at the activities of your organisation. And so the slice that we were asked to look at today was our approaches to adoption. So this has just been pulled together um, this morning, and we learnt some stuff along the way. Um, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today and I'm able to answer some of the questions. Les Baxter, um, Eric Hartner, and Ujaz Qureshi here. Um, I'm going to take it at a very different level to what you've seen before. So I'm going to be talking about the culmination of some of the technologies and science that you've seen. And we sort of refer to them as agricultural innovation. So the slice that I'm looking at is acknowledging there's some fabulous research going on, how do we get the results of that research into the hands of the farmers? And I'm going to be talking about the farmers in the developing world in order to have the impact on food security that's really driving this research. So I'm going to start with introducing ACIA and the International Food Security Centre, discussing some of our approaches to adoption, and then we'll give a few examples of the projects that we've been doing. So ACR is a statutory authority within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Portfolio. We're an independent agency, therefore. We're part of the aid program. And um, we're both a research funder and a manager. We're about 31 years old, and we're better known internationally than we are nationally. Um, and we also have not only our headquarters in Canberra, but we have about a dozen offices across the developing world. So we do a number of things. Um, we're probably best known for commissioning research into improving agricultural production and other activities as you'll hear later on in the developing countries. And we do that by uh, brokering partnerships. So we're a bit like a marriage broker. We bring together Australian research partners, many of our partners are in the room today, and international and um, developing country researchers to solve uh, problems to do with agriculture and food security in their countries. A lot of the work that we do has direct and indirect benefits back to Australia. And the Crawford Fund at the end of last year released a book, Doing Well, We're Doing Good, which really attempts to quantify the benefits of that, whether it be through some of the works, um, work on improved genetic resources, it could be new technologies and techniques that we can use, it can be through scientific we also have significant training programs, both formal through PhD studies and informal at a sort of policy level. We're known for communicating a lot of the work that we do, and we also administer Australia's contribution, which is quite significant and growing, to the International Agricultural Research Centres, or the CGIAR. And we've heard a bit about, well, the last talk talked about ERI, for instance. And we have a very close relationship to the um, the um, research prioritisation activity that's currently un be under being undertaken at the moment through the CG. Um, you may be aware with the change of government, the current focus now in terms of the aid program is on economic diplomacy. And we've all been spending a lot of time defining what that is, understanding and looking at how it relates to our work. Um, ACI is really fortunate that it's not difficult to do, that pretty much almost everything we do falls within the bands of um, economic development, improving trade, diplomatic relations. It's well known that investment in um, the agricultural sector improves GDP investment. For, it's four times better than investing in any other sector. So we know that investing in agriculture is just really going to help the economic development in those countries. Recently we did a study and we looked at, at the projects that we have and we found that 75% of the projects that we're currently undertaking is focused on the market access and value chain work. And I think if you'd done that review maybe 15 years ago, I'm Tony Fisher's here somewhere, um, it would be much more on the production end. So this is something that's been happening anyway. And that's because of the complicated systems that we're working in. Um, just an example, because Les is here, um, the, the Pakistan Mango Project is an active project that's underway at the moment. 
and it's looking at improving the transport of mangoes using sea freight and then controlled atmosphere into the Netherlands. Um, they're at sea for a very long time, but the, some, the results of the research that we've done, and it's still underway, has shown that through this um, transportation, they arrive in perfect condition and it's really opened up the markets for the mango growers there. So that's just one little example of how we can relate to the aid for trade or economic diplomacy agenda. So the Australian International Food Security Research Centre is a new initiative. It was announced at the Chogham at the end of 2011. Um, our focus is on accelerating adoption. Um, and so when we talk about food security, we're really looking at the full definition of agricultural production, um, access to food, and utilisation, which is another way of saying food quality, including nutrition quality, including safe food um, and non-toxic food. So in order to do that, we've really tried to bridge the gap between the research and the development um, professionals and try and involve them early on in the research in order to improve the chance of um, development and adoption. And we also work significantly through partnerships. At the moment, the Food Security Centre is focused in um, South, Southern and Eastern Africa. The work that we do, and this is part of ensuring it's adopted, has to be identified at a country or sub-regional or pan-African level. And we're really fortunate that there's such strong leadership when it comes to agricultural research in Africa that we've been able to leverage off. Um, in June this year at the African Union, all of the African countries will be signing on to an African science agenda, which is really laying out the priorities for anyone, including the CG and other international agencies and, and the national agencies within Africa, in terms of research priorities and what that development outcomes that, these, that this work is aiming to achieve. We're also really keen to leverage off existing work, and that also means utilising co-investment, particularly with the private sector, and we'll talk a bit about that later. And it's also, um, I'm not going to talk too much about gender, but just to recognise that in the areas that we work, the majority of the farmers are women, yet they don't have anywhere near the access to basic technologies, um, seeds, um, credit, land, information, or market, and um, it's really low-hanging fruit. And if we just focused on ensuring, without doing any more research, ensuring that the women farmers of Africa had access, the same access to what the men farmers do, we could improve agricultural yields by you know, 30 percent, which equates to about 150 million people no longer going hungry. And then finally, we're also cognizant of being, being able to draw on where Australia's comparative advantage is, and we've heard quite a bit about that earlier today. So what is it that Australia's really good at, and what sort of technologies and um, farming techniques can we export? So this is the theory of change for our centre. Um, I just want to draw your attention to two things. One is this land. So, so we have a, a three research programs which pretty well reflect the definitions of production, markets and nutrition and then we have some capacity building programs. But the lens that all of our activities operate through is looking at accelerating the adoption. And then we have some intermediate development outcomes here. Greater access to ag technologies, um, better informed and supported policies, increased access to more nutritious and safe food, less post-harvest loss, with the aim for of um, you know, food security goal. Now, this, this graph um, has since been updated. I don't have the latest data. But it shows that Africa here is really lagging behind the rest of the world, not only in producing improved varieties, but also in adopting improved varieties. I've only got data here, as I said, for 2010 for Africa, but it's 35% adoption, and that's significantly behind the rest of the world. So in Asia, it's about 60%, and in South America, it's about 80%. So we're, so we're really focusing on, you know, why is that? And there's a whole stack of reasons why that is. And so 
we're trying to put some data and some a better understanding about that rather than relying on some of the anecdotal evidence that's out there at the moment. This is one view of an impact pathway and I wanted just to show you a couple of things. So the area that we've all traditionally focused on is doing research and delivering scientific outputs and that's including the CGIAR. Where we're now being asked to work is here and that's developing or delivering development outcomes or intermediate development outcomes. So really engaging the end user in the research cycle and ensuring that at least with our target group of users they're able to adopt and use the outputs of the research. Now as you can see we're sort of losing control here. We're losing the, the area that we tightly control is this part here and we're all really good at being able to deliver these um, outputs or results but this is the area that um, the, science, the agricultural scientific world is being pushed into and that means we need to partner with different people. We need to get social scientists and anthropologists and a whole range of other people on the team early on in order to ensure that by the end of the project we're heading into this sphere as well. So the Food Security Centre that I'm the director of is really focused on, as I said, adoption and looking at the constraints and the incentives and just trying to understand that better. And with those learnings, trying to incorporate that into some of our future research projects. So while our projects are doing fantastic science on whatever the issue they're looking at, in addition to that, we've asked them to identify what the impediment to adoption is in their project, whose behaviour within that project, so who are the key stakeholders in that project, needs to change in order to remove that. And that could be the researchers, could be the farmers, could be the policy makers, could be the extension agents, could be the private sector. And what mechanism is being used in that project to reduce it. And I'll share some of those mechanisms with you in a moment. Well, actually, here they are here. Um, so some of our projects are relying on leveraging off existing national programs and policies to ensure scale-out. Um, utilising the private sector is really key, especially for sustainability. Um, innovation platforms and best practice hubs are things that are particularly successfully um, being adapted in Africa. Innovation platforms are where you put all the players along the value chain together to solve a problem. Um, Brenton's here with us today and um, ANU are doing a small scale irrigation project with us in a couple of countries in Africa. Really the basis of the change that they're seeking to achieve is through innovation platforms and taking a high level policy top down and a farmer based management bottom up approach and bringing them together through an innovation platform. Gender empowerment is particularly powerful as is looking at what's happening at a system level rather than just a commodity level. Um, institutional capacity building, and Eric's going to come in in the end and talk about some of the work we're doing looking at demand pull instead of technology push. But before I go there, I just wanted to also recognise that ACR is renowned for some of the impact assessment work it's been doing over the last 30 years and adoption study work. This work generally happens at least three years after the end of the project. It's independently done and um, the adoption studies aren't done on all projects but um, they really provide us with not just quantitative but qualitative information on what are the characteristics of our projects that have really had good and successful adoption and are there some characteristics that are common to all of them. Um, when we started in Africa, we actually went back through the last 30 years or so and compiled the data and there wasn't a particularly strong level of adoption, but where there was success, it was really dependent on having the end users on board at the very beginning of the research and also having really clear dissemination or impact pathways identified through the project. This is some of the work that's come out um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it in too much detail, but you can see the factors inhibiting the success and then the corollary here in terms of what was successful. Um, lack of incentive, so knowing 
It's, I mean, we talked earlier about risk. It's really about farmers being in a position to take a risk and they need to be able to have, have demonstrated to them what the impact of whatever the change is. Being able to know about it and access it is obviously a major inhibiting factor. And then there's a whole lot of stuff about infrastructure, policy factors, etc. Continuity of staff is a, is a big one and it's something that is really important when you're looking at technologies such as agricultural modelling, like the AppSim stuff we saw earlier. If you've got really mobile staff and this requires a lot of expertise to be held in country, um, then we've had quite unsuccessful adoption levels where there's been a lot of movement of staff in these countries, for example. Okay, so here's an example of a project which is really leveraging off national program. Um, Ethiopia and Rwanda have got major agroforestry programs underway at the moment. You know, they're pledging to plant 100 million trees over a period of time. We're looking at integrating tree crops into farming systems through this project, into maize systems in particular. So it's really looking at, on the one hand, the spacings and the type of species in order to improve the maize yield. And the results are really good. I mean, in a good season, we can double or treble the maize yields in those areas. In a bad season, that may not be the case in terms of maize, but we've got alternative livelihood options through fodder, through wood products, and particularly through food. And it's interesting, a lot of these communities that we're working in have been quite adamant that they want to grow. They want those tree crops to be food crops um, rather than fodder crops, which is um, interesting, but of course really important for the sustainability of that project. But the other thing we're looking at is can these national programs and the extension services that they're training around this pro these projects um, provide an effective scale-out mechanism. And ECRAF, the World Agroforestry Centre, is the project leader in that project. This is one looking at the private sector. Um, interestingly, Small-scale mechanisation has not reached Africa. It's still hand hose, as in back in the biblical time. And there's a whole lot of things happening, such as urbanisation, um, conflict, disease, which is really lowering the labour force within smallholder farms. And the women farmers just aren't able to be as productive as they'd like because they just don't have the ability all the time in the day. So this project is looking to introduce handheld small two-wheel tractors to improve planting and harvesting, but also processing and transport as well. Um, but we're really talking about models of small um, hire and lease schemes. So this, while there's a lot of agronomy and a lot of engineering in this project, the nub of it for us in terms of adoption is it's testing a whole range of business models in these different areas to see what can deliver sustainability. And the other interesting part of this project is it's an example of South-South cooperation. So we've got India and Bangladesh who have probably 90% uptake of these um, two-wheel tractors in their farming systems to come and work with our African partners um, and look at you know, importing it, maintaining it, leasing it, those sorts of things. This is being led by Synod. Uh, best practice hubs is another method that we're looking at, and this project is really focused on peri-urban vegetables to improve not only nutrition but also livelihoods, and it's got a very strong focus on youth. And that's in recognition of the urbanisation that we're seeing so dramatically in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's predominantly the youth, and they're going to the cities, and there's no, there's no work for them. They're quite entrepreneurial. Um, and by them leaving the land, there's less, the rural land, there's less people left to grow food. So peri-urban agriculture is seen as quite an attractive option for farming because it's high value, um, it's fast paced, there's many opportunities to do entrepreneurial value adding services and industries that spin off that. This project's being led by the World Vegetable Centre, ABRDC, and you can see the countries that it's been operational in. It's been really successfully tested in Western Africa. And this is an example of the model. And it's sort of a combination of research on site and demonstration sites um, where a whole range of activities happen, as well as training in those sites. And associated with that is a lot of work 
in terms of um, variety selection, developing seed systems, developing post-harvest technologies to reduce waste, developing integrated pest management technologies to use in the field, um, and um, reduce the anti-nutritional aspects of the production. And then over here we've got the consumer end, which is really nutrition and home economics about using some of these crops. Some of these crops are indigenous crops that haven't been used for quite a while and people have forgotten how to cook with them, the market access, um, etc. Another area that we've just started to work in is, um, and this is really building on Australia's comparative advantage. Australia's really strong in biosecurity and there's some of the aspects that we do here which is quite transferable to these countries. And in our consultations, it became really evident that intra-regional trade is seen as a key pathway to food security. And there's a number of obstacles to that, so that's moving food or seed or produce from one country to another across borders. Um, and one of the obstacles that we think we can deal with is our biosecurity obstacles. And that's just because of the lack of capacity in some basic, basic surveillance, risk assessment, etc., monitoring. So we've currently got out a tender, um, we have a call for an expression of interest for Australian providers to work with us in developing some capacity training of sort of mid-level policy people within the African region and to develop an alumni of expertise at a regional level um, and also develop linkages with Australian expertise to try and unlock at least one of the obstacles to um, food security in the region. Which ultimately, while we're focused on domestic and regional, could lead to international trade as well. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Eric just to finish off. No? Yeah, go ahead. Um, this particular project is uh, in alliance with ourselves, the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, and the Crawford Fund. So as Melissa said, we are uh, focused on, on studying and researching adoption. Uh, there's a, a perception that uh, maybe some of the improved varieties that uh, plant breeders of the uh, public sector in the developing countries have gone out to farmers in the past uh, decades have not been adopted. So we'll, uh, we'll try and um, uh, explore uh, this. Um, so here I... Um, I've just summarized very briefly um, the lack of adoption questions that we want to study. So the, the traditional varieties are massively used by, by farmers, but uh, in Africa in particular there's a big shift from self-consumption to a new range of utilization of the food. The traders become involved. Um, a lot of new demands on the crops uh, between the fresh market and now the supermarket in the growing cities of Africa processing now export. So all the question we are asking is how to get the market signals that are now emerging to impact on the researchers. And basically this uh, study that we are undertaking with a range of other partners will try and understand what makes a good plant breeder to address the needs of the market and determine those needs. Okay, and so if I have another few minutes just about adoption of what we do, uh, I've been involved at SER on the conservation farming projects, which are uh, one of the uh, most, um, one of the best application of Australia's expertise into um, uh, developing countries. So, because it's not uh, a well-known story, uh, we had uh, for a long time a project in the drylands of northern Iraq, which is coming to an end uh, this year. But as an offshoot of that project and without any investment of the Australian government, conservation farming studies have been used by local farmers in Syria. And despite the conflict in Syria, we kept into contact with the people who were involved in the project for the last seven or eight years. And it's important to note that um, in the background of conflict and, and all the difficulties people have, life goes on. And so, for example, that. Uh, uh, extension agent. She's a scientist at the, uh, in a small research station near the town of Hama. And uh, after having been exposed to the uh, 
research experiments on conservation farming and no-till. She's actually continued to promote the technology and even today she's conducting uh, field experiments, sorry, on station experiments and also dissemination uh, to farmers. Uh, now, it's, it's important to note that uh, a major factor in the technology adoption in these circumstances is the fact that the farmers have a strong interest in saving fuel because diesel's availability in, in Syria at the moment is very limited. Uh, we're finishing the project in Iraq on a, a high note um, and so one of the major contributions of Australia is about the design of the appropriate cedar for no-till uh, planting of uh, cereal and legumes. So here you have on the left a, a picture of a field day where uh, a no-till cedar is introduced to the farmer. And the gentleman here with a hat is the leader of the project in Iraq. He's uh, an agricultural research scientist at the University of Mosul in the Nineveh province of Iraq. And so he said, we, we can't travel to Iraq. It's a, a place where, as a federal government uh, agent, we, we are not allowed to travel. But we have regular meeting and contact with, with these people. Uh, on the left here, an interesting uh, reflection on the continuity of Australian assistance to the Middle East. Um, this machine is a cedar manufactured in South Australia by John Shearer, uh, a famous uh, Australian agricultural equipment company, which has been converted to do no-till no uh, agriculture uh, recently. And um, on the, la on the uh, basis of that, we now have in Mosul, in northern Iraq, uh, local workshop, small um, operators developing um, local cedars uh, for no-till farming, which we believe is going to uh, produce sustainability of this work because now there will be uh, machinery available that's locally made. And so that's on the right, the first prototype that's been tested and validated by the scientists we support. And so it's called Hafida, which means conservation in, in Arabic.